how do you pay tribute to a legend? A woman who both made and changed the landscape of Jewish children's literature forever. A remarkable woman who just happened to be my mom. Greetings, everyone. I'm Joe Taylor Marshall. And for all of you who are watching, listening, contributing to this program, I want you to know how truly grateful I am for your sharing my mother's stories and her story with me. For those of you who haven't read this biography, I am discreetly holding it up. I want you to know that Amazon twice sold out of it. I had trouble getting it myself. And I think the reason for that was that all the wonderful librarians across the country had such an interest in my mother's books that they wanted to read about her too. I've jotted down a few additional memories of my mom for fun and safekeeping. I can't believe my mother's actually 120 years old. The downside of that is if you do the math, you'll know that I'm 88. But I console myself with a quote from a Gilbert and Sullivan operetta called Trial by Jury. And the quote goes, she can very well pass for 43 in the dusk with the light behind her. So I'm hoping the light is behind me today. For all I know, my mother's probably up there directing this event or staging one of her heavenly productions, no pun intended, with any of the children who happen to be up there with her. As many of you know already, and who appreciate my mom, Sidney Taylor, known as Sid to her family, was an incredibly multi-talented woman, really ahead of her time. She was an actress, she was a dancer, she was an author, and she was a musician. All of this is captured in a forthcoming book by Rich Michelson called Sidney Taylor, One of a Kind. It's going to be a picture book for little children, and the premise is that you can grow up and be any of these things as long as you want it badly enough and work at it. There also is a book uh, that came out recently by Jacqueline Davies uh, about two little boys, one called Sidney and one called Taylor. The one is called um, Sydney and Taylor Explore the Whole Wide World and Sydney and Taylor Take a Flying Leap, which is kind of a funny title. But they asked the publisher um, and she confirmed that Jacqueline Davies did indeed name these characters pur purposely because she loved my mother's books. So that was, that's going to be a very nice tribute too. Many of the plays my mother produced and directed, she did so at Sedgwin Camps in Port Jervis, New Jersey. She was also a teacher, a guidance counselor, and mentor to many of the young campers, children who remember her fondly as Anne Sid, because Sedgwin wanted to make everybody who worked there a relative. I'll tell you a secret though, the one thing she was not so hot at was cooking. In fact, my father used to call her hamburgers hockey pucks. She also declared a war on sugar, which she seldom surrendered. My dad took to hiding his candy bars in the uh, Le Chandelier, like Ray Milland in the Lost Weekend movie. As you can imagine, it was pretty dark in our apartment because my father called it atmospheric. He didn't want to turn on the chandelier light because his candy would melt. I'm pretty sure I must have inherited my sugar gene from that side of the family. Actually, I grew up in a rather unorthodox, literally and figuratively, household. Not much furniture, aside from a huge ballet-style mirror that almost took up the whole living room wall for my mother's exercises and rehearsals. I always assumed that this must be part of everybody's decor. I recall one day going to my little nursery school friend's house 
and asking, where's your mirror? She says, oh, come with me. She drags me into the bathroom and shows me the little mirror on the back of the medicine cabinet. No, that wasn't a mirror to me. There was also a prized chickering baby grand piano in the corner. It was always carefully covered until it had to be hoisted out the fifth story window minus its legs when we moved. Although my mother was not religious, she never kept a kosher household, nor sent me to Hebrew school, but she was rooted firmly in the cultural aspects of Judaism. Actually, that was one of the main reasons she wrote about her all-of-a-kind family traditions, for me to learn about them. She didn't even change their names, so I could better identify with my aunts, Ella, Henny, Charlotte, and Gertie. They're all gone now, but some of the cousins are left, and especially my cousin Judy, who is the ba baby Gertie's child, and she'll be working with the books after I'm up with my mother in another 120 years. When I think back of, on these years, I realize my mother incorporated and lived by two essential principles. No doubt these were inherited by her own German-born mother, who was both stoic and stern, rather like the grandmother in Neil Simon's play Lost in Yonkers. She kind of scared me, that's for sure, when we went home to visit. There were always these, what they call these anti-Macassar things, on the, and God forbid one would be out of sync. <laughs> You'd hear about it. Anyway, the first principle my mother adhered to was that interpersonal emotions are best expressed creatively through art. And second was that discipline and immersive hard work will cure whatever ails you. In regard to number one, I never even saw my parents hug nor argue. Although this, this was a true love story, my father was incredibly supportive of whatever my mother was doing in the art world, never mind the hockey pucks. He himself contributed a great deal to her success, as night after night he would come home from a long day at Caswell Massey, which was the tailor-owned pharmacy, and sit by her side at the typewriter, there were no computers in those days, reading and editing drafts of whatever she was writing. And it was he who secretly sent the pages of all of a kind stories off to a literary contest, which she won. The rest being, as they say, history, or in this case, another career history. Regarding the second principle about the discipline, I'll just say that didn't go over so well with her only child when I became a rebellious teenager, and believe me, I was. One time, a school nurse sent me home for a headache, which I was causing more than suffering from. And my mother promptly sent me back. I did get better fast sitting in the principal's office. By the way, so my mother's idea for a cure for whatever ails you wasn't so far off the mark. My mother was also a woman with high standards for herself as well as others. If a product or service was defective, or not performing, a detailed letter of complaint would follow, with some of them being hilarious, or certainly unforgettable, like the time she wrote a series of missives about a shrinking tablecloth, which with repeated washings had become a washcloth, or a napkin. After much ado back and forth with supervisors and managers, Macy's finally agreed to take the item back. Several months later, she found the receipt. It was clearly marked Bloomingdale's. When I was quite young, my mother read aloud to me from classics such as Mary Poppins, which was also as yet relatively unknown in those days, and also Little Women, which might well have been the inspiration for her own family stories and me being Joe. With early exposure to good literature, 
theater and dance. All of that and the vocabulary of art made me much more inclined to the arts. While I was not so great with science or math classes, to this day I can recite who was in what show, recall most of the lyrics, and recapture with allowances for arthritis, Martha Graham's contraction and release theory and her movements. I was very proud when Barbara Morgan uh, photographs of the, the, the Graham Dance Company came out and there was a picture of my mother in it. Although all the dancers were in a circle bending down so all you could see were their rear ends, I would point to the picture and proclaim, that's my mother's behind. On a less joyful note, I have to say that at the time of my mother's sad passing in 1978, I was teaching at Columbia University in New York. Following the moving funeral services and the many tributes and accolades, I left the Riverside Chapel and went immediately back to work. My colleagues, noting my grief, were astounded. Why did you ever come back so soon, they asked. Because, I said, that's what my mother would have wanted. Discipline and work will lessen hardships and cure what ails you. Despite my youthful struggles with my mother, I am eternally grateful for the many exquisite gifts she gave me and countless others of her reader children who are now the grandmothers of the new reader generation. In particular, she inspired my deep love for the theater, the dance, music, and other arts, and especially my admiration for talented writing. May her legacy live on as such for another 120 years and beyond, when we'll all celebrate her 240th. Thank you so much. Joe, tell us how your mom came to write All of a Kind Family. Well, I think I remember saying to her, how come there isn't any Jewish heroines? I, everybody had blonde hair and blue eyes. The only one who was dark was Snow White, and all she had was uh, seven dwarfs. Um, and I think my mother took that to heart. Uh, she also knew I was basically an only child and wanted me to know what being in a large family was like. So uh, this was a way to tell me. And it was my father who encouraged her to type them up because they were wonderful stories. And I'm glad he did. Are the stories in All of a Kind Family true? Or which parts of them are made up and which parts of them are true? Well, from what I gather, and of course I wasn't around in those days, um, basically true. Of course, she uses some poetic license, and her editor kept harping on making the stories more generic and less Jewish, because up until this time, there had been no Jewish stories. In fact, they had a big uh, argument about the 4th of July. Uh, she wanted it, the 4th of July included, the editor, because she wanted to show that they, they depicted American holidays as well as Jewish holidays. Um, my mother wasn't too happy with that, but, you know, you do what your editor wants. So, so that's why it's in there. But basically, I think it's pretty much true. Some exaggeration is poetic license, you know. And um, the names are all the real names of your family members. Absolutely. Absolutely. Except hers. She was born Sarah, and in those days you could not get, uh, in the 50s, published easily if you were a woman, and also she wanted to be different. Now, from what I hear, um, uh, what's her name, the one who was in The Alien? Sigourney Weaver? Sigourney. She was Sarah, too, and she wanted to be, thank you, my memory's going, 88, what do you expect? But anyway... Um, she uh, she sang, changed her name, too. So. so that's why the book is called From Sarah to Sydney. Exactly, yes. Um, and there were also more brothers than in the book, right? In the, in yes, the book, there was Charlie. 
there were three brothers um, born after the five girls. Um, and I, I think my grandmother was a bit tired of not only being pregnant, but having only girls. However, um, one of them tragically uh, ended in the dentist's office because he had, I understand, some kind of infection and they overdosed him on anesthesia. He died in the, in the dentist chair and his name was Ralphie and my father's name was Ralph. And I always felt that my mother was kind of uh, memorializing her, her brother. Uh, the other two uh, were named uh, uh, Irving and Jerry. Jerry was the baby. Jerry was only 10 years apart from my birth. So I had an uncle who was pretty young. And I remember in my deepest memory him shaving to go out with his then fiance Norma. And I was standing there watching this shaving and telling him, you missed it over here. <laughs> but he was, he was a lovely person. He was the last one to go. He had his 80th birthday and we were all there, so. What was it like being the child of a famous author? And what is it still like being the child of a famous author? Well, it's a mixed blessing. Um, I'm, I'm very proud of my mother, uh, but I don't want to steal her thunder. And I've had people offer to write Joe of all of a kind family. And I said, no, I said, I want I don't want to dim any of her luster. She's entitled to that. Also, in all honesty, she was so devoted to her arts. There wasn't too much time left for me. So I did everything I could to draw attention to myself, including dyeing my hair jet black, because I wanted to look like dancer Ann Miller, who you older people will remember, who had jet black hair that never moved. And uh, I would sneak into the bathroom and I would pour a whole thing of Noreen rinse over my head, quick, so my mother wouldn't see. Most of the time the capsule caught in my hair. And when it rained, rivulets of black would come down. But I thought I was gorgeous. It looked like shoe polish. But I would do things like that. I was, I was a naughty, a naughty child. Um, but my mother struggled with me and, uh, if she said yes, I said no. I think I've said before that wonderful song from the Fantastics, why did the kids put beans in their ears? They did it because we said no. <laughs> so I did the same thing. My mother was also rather stern looking, uh, pulled back hair, uh, not much makeup. So of course I went to the extreme. I slapped on the makeup, I blew up the hair. The other day somebody said to me, who did your hair, a light socket? <laughs> <laughs> but I've always had big hair because I think uh, it has to balance the rear. You can't have a big butt and a small head. So that's where that came from. So in 2021, a biography of your mom was published. Can you hold up the book? From Sarah to Sydney, the woman behind all of a kind family. So tell us about the creation of the book and how you were involved in that. Well, I w I've been contacted through the years by many, many people wanting to write my mother's story. One lady called me and sent me a script she had written about a whale for Disney. And all I could think of was, was whale Jewish? I mean, you know. But when June Cummins uh, contacted me, I really was impressed. Not so with some of the others. <laughs> But uh, I uh, went to see her and uh, Mace, my, my spouse, came with me and we were both impressed. And we invited her to our home where I had a locked trunk in the basement. I had never opened it and I knew it was all my mother's diaries and whatever. I felt it would be intrusive to open it, but I kept it. I gave June the key to the trunk and she started writing and poor June had to come to our home for like 10 summers and the only quiet place was the basement 
And there she was in the basement writing away. And on top of everything else, she was highly kosher. And we were not. Um, as I've told in other interviews, we never ate so much tuna fish in our life. We could tell how many weeks June had been there by how many empty tuna fish cans there were. I once ran out, as soon as I heard she was kosher, I ran out and got Hebrew National Hot Dogs. They answered a higher authority, right? Well, I got them, she wouldn't touch them. They weren't kosher enough. I never realized there were degrees of kosherness. So back to the tuna fish. We did also, she ate my corn casserole because that I guess was permissible. And we had paper plates for the whole time she was there. But she was lovely and she started integrating my mother's history with what was going on in the world. And that was so fascinating. I learned things about my mother I never knew. There's a lot of warts and pimples in this book. And let me tell you, you better read it first and quickly before it's banned. It's got suicide, it's got homosexuality, it's got incest, it's got a lot of stuff. But that's what makes books interesting, right? So, and it's worth reading. And I, I was fascinated by things that I never knew. Um, it's, it's a mixed blessing being the child of, a, of an artistic soul because all you see in the house are artistic souls. We lived right below Martha Graham, to whom my father was constantly uh, lending money. I have a lot of IOUs from her. Um, and Louis Horst, who was her accompanist. And my father was very interested in dance and he started the Dance Observer magazine with Louis Horst. Uh, and he's mentioned in several uh, books about dance for the work he did. Um, there was no dance magazine in those days. That was early on. It was a very erudite kind of publication. But he also, he loved to write. He wrote two stories I never forgot. One of them was uh, about Miss Rena Lopside, who was actually a friend of my mother's, of course he renamed her Miss Flopside, she would come and spout communism and he'd get angry and angrier and angrier and because they were socialists but not communists. And one day he asked her to leave. So he wrote this story about Miss Rena Lopside and it starts out, I am highly ashamed and appalled at my behavior when I took a poker and hit Miss Lopside over the over the head and she landed on the carpet and she made a mess of the carpet you know it was that kind of a story but it was a wonderful story he also wrote a story long before the the movie that came out with dustin hoffman um about having hitler in a dentist chair and what he would do so he was he was very prolific at writing and he wrote he wrote a lot of um under pseudonyms he wrote for the Dance Observer just for fun to see if he could get published, even though he had started the magazine with Louis Horst uh, with a pseudonym. And uh, Louis wrote back, well, it's an interesting story, but I'm not sure it's quite ready for this magazine. <laughs> my, mother, my mother and my father laughed their heads off about that. But everyone in the family wrote. Charlotte wrote a book about being deaf later on. She also wrote a... Uh, her own story, but Susan, her her daughter, unlike myself, I think felt more private about it and didn't want it published. I said, Susan, they know everything about me. They might as well know about you too, but no, she didn't want it, which I respect. Also, Jerry uh, published his letters uh, from World War II to Norma, the lady he eventually married and loved, and they're wonderful and they're in the Library of Congress. Are there any interesting details you can tell us about the real Ella and Henny, Sarah, Charlotte, Gertie, ah, the family? I hated being with them because they were always trying to outdo each other, screaming at the top of their lungs. I could never understand a word they were saying, and they were always talking grown-up stuff. One day they were all talking about a movie called Gone with the Wind, 
I was so bored because I didn't understand anything. I had not seen the movie that I snuck into the kitchen and ate my grandmother's chocolate chips. Well, you can be sure I got punished for that. But um, they were competitive. I guess when you're five girls, everybody tries to speak up. But they were very different, sort of like the Desperate Housewives. <laughs> Ella was extremely talented. She, was, uh, she had a beautiful singing voice. She was the oldest. And she would have gotten on the stage, except that my grandmother uh, nixed it. She felt Hollywood was not the place for, you know, um, a Jewish woman. So that ended her career. Um, Henny was a tomboy. And Henny was a lot of fun. And uh, her, she was married twice. Her second husband was a problem, which you'll read about in the book. Uh, in today's world, he would have been a real problem. But I thought he was wonderful. He took me everywhere. Uh, he was very handsome. He was a basketball player. And I liked being with this gorgeous man. Um, and they, he owned a Castle Hill pool in the Bronx with a big sprawling complex of pools and gyms. And, uh, and he also owned a trucking company. And Henny drove a truck. In fact, she was in charge at Sedgwin. They all worked at Sedgwin, which, by the way, was not my thing at all. And they sent me there a couple of years. I couldn't wait to leave. First of all, because I knew nothing about Judaism and everything was Jewish. And they talked about it in Jew Jewish terms. And it just wasn't my thing. Except the, the plays. I liked that part of it. But um, Henny was in charge of the maintenance crew. And she was a tough boss. You know? She was a tough lady. But... Uncle Harry, which is her second husband, um, everybody, the kids loved because he was, he was very funny. Um, he also, well, he, he just, uh, let me say this. He was a basketball star, and I think he deliberately ended his life. He went out, he was told he had a heart condition, and he went out and to, you know, worked out and uh, kind of passed on. But I, uh, I enjoyed his jokes and I enjoyed his company. Although, uh, as I say, he was problematic. Uh, let's see. Well, we're up to my mother. She was the third. Well, you know about her. Uh, and she, she was a complex woman. She was, uh, when she was young, everybody called her Misela or Little Mouse because she was supposedly shy. But as she got older, she got quite political, very outspoken for feminism. Uh, and my parents met at a Yipsel meeting, which for anybody old enough stood for Young People's Socialist League. And my father always tells the story of seeing this gorgeous blonde from the rear. That was my mother. She had blonde hair. And uh, he couldn't wait to meet her. And he sidled over to her. She turned around. He says, eh, she's not so gorgeous. My mother used to hit him <laughs> when he said that. <laughs> but they had a, a very close marriage. They did. And, and that was wonderful. There wasn't always room for me in it. But, you know, I think my mother was very conflicted when she became pregnant. I think on the one hand, she was delighted. On the other hand, she wasn't sure. So I'm glad the sh wasn't sure <laughs> held uh, away and the delighted sort of took over. Although as I got older, she wasn't so delighted. But she was she was terrific. Uh, just, you know, I, I idolized her for her talent. So. Okay. And then Charlotte? Oh, we're up to Charlotte already. Charlotte was a strange one. Charlotte was into every cult you can imagine. 
She joined a nudist colony at one point. She was um, she was a miracle uh, in a way because um, she fell in love with a Gentile uh, boy. And of course, Grandma would have none of it, nor would Grandpa. Um, and she was she had to give up her relationship, and she began to starve herself, which nowadays is bulimia and anorexia, but they didn't know what it was. And it got so bad that she lost her period. And they told her she'd never have children. And Charlotte um, went out and adopted later on when she uh, was married. As I, I remember distinctly my mother taking me to the to see the new baby that Charlotte and Lou had uh, brought home. Um, and by some miracle, she got pregnant. However, she's been written up in medical books. But Charlotte was very stingy. Not only did she withhold food from herself, she withheld food from her daughter and from other people. If you brought a cake to Charlotte's house, she would either stow it away in the refrigerator for another time or cut it in half so you'd get half the cake. Even if it was 16 people, you'd get enough for eight, you know? Or she would say, she, I just made this. There are no calories in it. Believe me, it tasted like there was no calories in it. But, you know, Charlotte had made, all of them had foibles. We all do. And uh, although I'm being public about some of them, I think that it needs to be told, and I'm not shy about it. The only word that angers me in the book is the word experimented. It's a word associated with the sentence, when Jo was 12, she experimented with homosexuality. Why is that an experiment? Had I been with a young man, would that have been an experiment too? So heterosexuality. So that betrayed, I don't think it was June, um, the prejudice of whoever wrote that. And I said that if there's a second edition, I want that word taken out. At 12, I knew exactly who I was. I lived in Greenwich Village. I lived in New York. And my mother said things that made me interested. She would say things like, oh, those lesbians on the sixth floor are fighting again. Well, don't you think I volunteered to go up to the sixth floor to take out the garbage so I could listen to them fighting? And she also gave me the classic lesbian novel, The Well of Loneliness, to read, which was banned in 1949. She gave that to me. I was a teenager. Um... And, of course, I fell madly in love with Stephen Gordon, the hero heroine of the book. I don't know if you've read it, but um, it's about a, a woman in England who was raised as a, as a man because her father wanted a son. And, of course, it ends tragically because in those days every book about that kind of perversion had to end tragically. But I think I spent the rest of my life looking for Stephen Gordon. Uh, and my mother was very ambivalent about it. On the one hand, she once said to me, are you still with that lesbian so-and-so? And I looked at her in the eye and I said, oh, I hope so. So that kind of took the wind out of the sails. One day I was just going to tell her, would you pass the gravy to a homosexual? At <laughs> a Thanksgiving dinner, but I didn't. But she knew. She knew from the get-go. As a matter of fact, I had love letters that were written to me at that age, and uh, she confiscated them, and she alphabetized them, and I think her intention was to write my story. She never got around to it, uh, which I'm glad about, and Laura Hobson, who wrote Gentleman's Agreement, beat her to it, uh, although it was about her son, but... Uh, uh, she was she was very into it. And all of our guests in the house, most of them were gay. Um, so, you know, how could I, I be expected in this crazy artistic world 
to have the uh, picket fence and the 2.5 children. I always wondered what the 0.5th child looked like, but, <laughs> but I was never unhappy with my life. I think my mother was concerned that at the time I would never have a happy life, but that's not true. I've been very lucky. And I did marry, we married uh, as soon as it was possible uh, in uh, Massachusetts, Connecticut area, because that's the only states that had it. And we had our honeymoon on the, on the Connecticut uh, River. And we went to have Mystic Pizza where Julia Roberts uh, filmed her, her movie. Uh, so I'm very lucky. And we, we uh, Mace has been very helpful. She's part of the, uh, part of the business with the book and uh, is really here to support me. And that's very nice too. Gertie was the smallest of the group. Charlotte, by the way, was the tallest and thinnest. Gertie was um, the baby at the time. She was not a well baby. She had something called, I could hardly pronounce, it was called erysipelas, which was a very bad sinus asthma-like condition. And um, so she was always sick and she lived with the, the, my grandparents, her, her parents, for quite a while in the same apartment. Um, she, as far as I know, was always had something because she, she was uh, weak in, in that sense, uh, her body. But she was, she and my, my mother talked a lot on the phone about their difficulties with their children. Judy, Gertie's only child, and she, she um, did not get along too well. And that's Judy's admission to me. Although later on, when um, Gertie was dying, Judy took care of her. Judy is a, a nurse practitioner. And they sort of made their peace, which, is, which was good. Um, I didn't mention it, but Charlotte also was a, a talented artist. She loved pictures of cats. And I think I've inherited that. I love cats. So um, that's one thing I, I did want to tell you. Well, I talked about Jerry a little bit. Um, he was my hero. He was very handsome. Um, Irving, I hardly knew, but Irving was funny. Irving had a wonderful sense of humor. I know um, when... Um, there was a funeral, I'm trying to remember which, which one it was even, but it was dead of winter, and we all got to the funeral parlor, and then there was practically nobody there. And Irving looks up and he says, oh, it's dead in here. <laughs> and that was the kind of humor he had. Um, and he had two sons, uh, and Jerry had a, a son and a daughter. Uh, and I had one, one daughter and a son. Uh, those who are still living, mainly are, are Susan, Judy, and uh, uh, my cousin. Uh, they're all cousins. And another cousin, Michael. Um, why is it important to you to support and maintain the Sydney Taylor Book Award? My God, it was my mother. <laughs> And they're wonderful stories, and I love every one of them. And for me, this is a way to keep her alive for the rest of the the rest of the time I'm here, and well after that. So I will do everything I can to continue that legacy. Are there any particular award-winning books that um, that you really connected with, or that you would want to highlight? You know, I have a whole library of award-winning books and it would be so hard for me to to pick one out although in my memory i very much like the book thief but there are other wonderful books and uh i try to read all of them there are hardly room for them anymore but they're 
boxes of them, and they're all autographed, and that's so nice that the authors do it. And it's so wonderful that they're able to reap the award and to have their books published. And that's why I established the Young, Young People's Award in addition to the Children's Award, because I think that's important. At, at that stage, that's where I began transitioning, and I think a lot of people, a lot of children find their identity sort of in the middle school area. What do you love about the Association of Jewish Libraries? What do I not love about the Association of Jewish Libraries would be a better question. I think they are a wonderful organization. I try my best to go to every one of the award ceremonies uh, and not to say the same thing so people aren't bored. Um, I'm so impressed with the judges who have to go through and read thousands of books. I don't know how they do it. I think it's so well organized. Um, I would hope the kosher food once in a while is better, but that's a minor detail. But I do look forward every year to the awards and to being a part of it, and I'm honored to be a part of it, and I will continue. And Judy will take over when I'm not here, as I said. So she's looking forward to it. She's much more Jewish than I am. You'll all love her. She's, I think, the only one who married a Jewish man of the cousins. So. Could you tell the story about the underwear drawer? Oh, well, yes. Um, when my father asked my mother to write, type up the stories, she threw them into her underwear drawer and forgot about them. She had read them to me, and that was the purpose, and fine. Well, unbeknownst to my mother, my father read about an award being given for the best children's book by a non-Jewish firm called uh, Wilcox and Follett. And on a lark, he fished them out of the underwear drawer and sent them off to Wilcox and Follett. Next thing you know, my mother gets a telegram. And for those of you who don't know what a telegram is, and by the way, I tried to send one recently, and the, the FedEx guy looked at me like I, I was crazy. What is that? <laughs> anyway, uh, it's a notification, okay, electronically, sort of the forerunner of what we're doing today. Uh, she got this telegram, congratulations. We're publishing your book. And you won $3,000. Now, in the 50s, $3,000 was well over $30,000, maybe more, maybe close to fifty. I mean, it was no small amount. Well, she called up her mother, my grandmother, and said, Mama, guess what? You're going to be immortal. And my grandma said, What? And she said, Well, they're publishing a book. My grandma says, so how much did you win? <laughs> that was the most important thing. Anyway, that's the underwear story. And that really began her whole new career because she would go around and talk about the books. She would use psychodrama with the uh, people because she had studied it. And... Um, I remember all my little friends, she would put them in a circle and do little things, little act out, little playlets, part of the stories with them. It used to embarrass the hell out of me because, you know, your mother should be like everybody else's mother, not <laughs> this odd person. But the little friends loved it. And uh, so she was, uh, she lectured all over and uh, she was very popular as, as a lecturer. And she enjoyed doing that, so that was good. And my father, who also was sort of an iconoclast in his own way, <laughs> uh, when uh, Rich Michelson was writing the book, he wanted to know what my father's dress, dress code was to, for the illustrations. I said, you know, in, in Sedgwick, he used to walk around in his boxer shorts. He called them his English walking shorts. 
because that, that was a sense of fashion. And in their apartment, every wall was a different color, blue and yellow and whatnot. I mean, it was uh, very much ahead of its time, too. And my mother's name on the nameplate was not Taylor. It was Sid Brenner, because she kept her maiden name. Now, who did that in those days? So it was very unusual. Unusual all the way around, but fun. Tell us about some of the fan mail that you've received from readers of all of the kind family. I love them. I try to answer whatever I can because if a child um, has the wherewithal to write, you know, I want to reply. I kind of got uh, censored for somebody said I'm pretending I'm impersonating my mother. No, I'm answering and saying thank you for writing to my mother. But at any rate, some of them are hilarious. Um, dear Mr. Taylor, because they think Sydney is a man, uh, I loved your books, but I wouldn't have written them different. So I wrote back, dear Jeffrey, when you publish your first book, I'd love to have a copy and see what you did different. Or, dear Mr. Taylor, how did you know uh, uh, so much about the Lower East Side? Were there roads back then? Or, dear Mr. Taylor, can you give me the recipe for crepe latch? <laughs> Spelled like that, crepe latch. My mother couldn't because she remember the hockey pucks. God knows what the crepe latch would be like. <laughs> but they're fun letters and they're meaningful. And sometimes teachers will send in a whole classroom full. I think that that's one of the assignments, maybe to read the book and then write. Oh. But the, I love them, they're and they're all in you know childish handwriting, and it's great. 